What I'm asking you to do is think. Please, think. Why do you do what you do? Why do you dress the way you dress? Why do you use the jewelry you use? Why do you do what you do with your money? Why do you do what you do with your time? Why do you watch what you watch on television or at the movies or on the computer? Why do you do what you do on the computer? Do you have God-glorifying reasons for all of it? Do you live in that faith, believing what I am doing is glorifying God? Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, you are to do it for the glory of God. We need to be people who think don't just do it because other people at school do it. Don't just do it because other people at work do it. The worldly system is everywhere around us. Do what you do because you can substantiate it from the Word of God. Period. Are your motives deceitful desire, worldly desire, desire that wages war against your flesh or against your soul, driven, are they driven by those passions or is it <coughs> driven by a desire to please God? That's what we have to ask ourselves. What is the motive? Well, I dress this way because I want to get this guy's attention. I hope you would see what the motive is. When the Bible says, if you want to get a guy's attention, the kind of guy that, guy's attention that you probably ought to be trying to get, you should be working on a meek and quiet spirit, ladies, knowing the Scriptures. That's what 1 Peter 3 says. I mean, young guys, if you're... If you're working out to get the lady's attention, you're working out because you want to be all hulked up and big and look like the world. Now look, physical exercise profits some. If it helps you discipline yourself and it helps you feel better and you're not near as tired during the day and you can get by with less sleep and it just overall makes you feel better, there may be a place for it. But is it godliness driven? what we wear. I mean, do you wear what you wear because you're wanting to glorify God? Do you give? Do you use your money in ways that are God-glorifying? What is your motive behind what you do with your money? If you're going to make the decision to have a television or not have one, I know Christians that have them. I know Christians that don't have them. What's your motive? What are you accomplishing? When you eat, why do you eat the way you do? When you drink. If you were going to say, well, the Bible allows me to drink alcoholic beverage, you need to ask yourself, why? Why are you doing it? Is there a motive there that is God glorifying? It's not God glorifying if you do things that will cause a brother to stumble and you do it right, before, right in front of them. If meat or drink cause your brother to stumble, you need to abstain. Why do we do what we do? Are we trying to win people to Christ? Hudson Taylor dressed like a Chinaman to win Chinamen, and he did. Paul became all things to all men that he might save some. By all means, he might save some. 
You see, when you're driven by love, when you're driven by a desire to save people, when you're driven by a desire to grow, when you're driven by a desire to become more godly, when you're driven by a desire to become more meek, more Bible knowledgeable, when you're driven by a desire not to make my brothers and sisters stumble, that there's see see the motivation versus when you just want pleasure. And so you're going to do what you want to do because you want fun. You're going to do what you want to do because you want to enjoy. You're going to do what you want to do because you want to satisfy these desires. That's dangerous ground. Listen, they wage war against the soul. And people lose their soul in this fight all the time. By God's grace, by God's strength, by God's power, abide in Christ and seek to live the right motives, bringing your thought life, bringing your motives in subjection to Christ all the time, in subjection to Christ, being led, guided, motivated by love. Let love rule your life. Let love for God and love for your fellow man rule your motives, not passions, but love. God help us. If you really believe that this is all true, if this is indeed, you know, you know what it says over in the what is it, Revelation 14? It says that when we enter into our rest, our deeds follow us. I'll tell you this, through all eternity, the things you do in this life in the service of Christ are going to follow you there. And yet you're giving yourself to the trivialities and the vanities of this life. Amazing! You know what? You're a professing child of God. You say you believe in eternal rewards. You say there's treasure to be had in heaven. But then you compare yourself with a lost man. And he's outrunning you. He's investing in all his stuff in this life because he believes it's going to bring him pleasure. You say you believe the greatest pleasures are at his right hand in the world to come. And yet by your life you're not proving it and he's outrunning you in the things, in his objectives, what he wants to accomplish than what you're running in. We speak one way, brethren, and we live another way. And we ought to hang our heads that this world should be outrunning us. Jesus Christ said, I would, you would show yourself in or out, hot or cold. And if you're going to be lukewarm, if you're going to serve me with a half heart, it sickens me, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. He's not speaking to some Turks over there in Izmir, bowing down to their Allah over at the no, he's, talking, he's speaking to a church just like I'm speaking to now. Not to the lost hordes out there. He's speaking to the church. And he's saying, if you're going to try to serve me with a half heart, divided heart, I hate it. It sickens me. Go one way or the other. But get off the middle. And if you're not ready, listen, and I say this as far as membership to this church, if you're not willing to commit to be hot and to commit to go all the way, I'm not saying God may not move you, God may not take you another place, that may happen. But when you come, you need to be committed to serve the living Christ with some heat, with some fervency, with some passion, with some commitment. If you want to play games, there's a lot of other places you can go play games. But we want to do it according to the Word, do we not? And it says, do it with fervency. It says, don't be slothful in this. Zeal matters. Passion matters. Over and over and over and over again in the Bible, we find intensity matters. Zeal matters. Wholeheartedness matters. Don't settle for anything less. Too many lazy Christians, or at least professing lazy Christians. Make no mistake about it. The Lord Christ is calling you to put away your idleness. Put away your slothfulness. All your laziness. All your half-heartedness. Serve Him as a slave with a boiling spirit. That's what we're called to do. Brethren, don't be slothful. Don't be idle. We have too much sloth and sluggardliness and slowness in Christians today, I'm serving the one who died for me. I'm serving the one who gave himself for me. I'm serving him whom 
gave himself up a fragrant offering to his Father on my behalf. Now let that sink in. Beloved, we don't just want to serve Christ. We want to love Christ. We're not like those pagans. Oh, I've got pictures in my mind. Hindus in their yard with their little dollhouse looking altars. Bowing really fast. And also, it's almost like you look at it and it's like that, that, that can be real. That's, that's, we're not like them. We don't serve our Christ like the pagans, all full of fear, all full of terror. Brethren, if, if Christ were to stand here right now, and you know, He would speak with authority and yet with compassion. If He spoke in that way and He said, look at my wounds. I've done this for you. What have you done for me? Is this not worth your fervency? Do not love the world or the things in the world if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. One thing about Scripture, it just drops it like a ton of lead right on you. So absolute. Why? I mean, come on, John. Give us a little slack here. Can I love some, some things in the world just a, a little? Why does, it, why does it seem like so often Scripture just... I mean, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Period. You know why? You know why I have to believe that? Because just like with the rest of John, if you come along and you say you know him and you don't keep his commandments, bang! Again, just boom, hit you with a ton of lead. You're a liar. Mm. Brethren, the reality is this. It's like Paul Washer said before. If you came in this door right now and you told us you just got hit by an 18-wheeler and you look just like you all look right now, we'd all say you're lying to us. I don't think that's, that's the basic weight of the matter. He's saying, look, when you're born again, and when you're indwelt by the Spirit of God, it is so radical and it so produces a love for God and a hate for this world that it is so stark, it is so real, it is so obvious that is there a battle? Well, yes, there's a battle because obviously we've got to wage war against these anti-soul forces, one of which is the world that we're not to be conformed to, we're not to love it. And so there is this fight not to do it, but it is so real and it is so... It, brethren, it isn't the kind of thing where you live your life in love with the world all the time and you're trying to get out the magnifying glass and stare and look and strain and squint to figure out if you're a Christian or not. The truth is, this is so, this is so obvious when it happens to somebody's life. It takes them where they're in this course and it totally spins them around so obviously that, brethren, I've seen it. I've seen this happen to people. The worldliness just starts to fall off one after another. It falls off. And I'll tell you this, people that have supposedly had this amazing, this amazing transformation happen in their life and conversion, and all of a sudden, two, three, four, five years down the road, the worldliness just hasn't fallen off, brethren. They're just, there's no truth to it. Mm -hmm. you, you say, well, you can't say that. You're judging. I can say that because God's Word says that. If that person shows by a continuous ongoing lifestyle that they're in love with the world, they do not love God. They are those adulteresses and adulterers that James is dealing with, and they're at enmity with God. Lay it down. Hands down, folks. This is, this is absolute. I mean, this is... Brethren, yes, there's a battle. I don't, I don't doubt that. But this is a battle for life and death. And that's what we're told here.